Listen to daddy, okay? <laughs> daddy tell you, David. Don't worry. What's going on everybody? Welcome to a special Cantonese episode of Fong Bros Food. Today we are here with Nelson Chan, we're here with Kev La, David and Andrew from the Fung Bros. This video is going to be really interesting because we are going to be going low and high and talking about everything Cantonese. And I think the reason that we wanted to do this video is because I think on our channel we talk about so many things that are relatable across Asian cultures. You know, it's Pan-Asian. One of the groups that we happen to be all very familiar with is the Cantonese group. Canto yes. Pride. And we are actually all different types of Cantonese because no. Cantonese just doesn't come from Southern China. Kev, where are your parents from? My parents were born and raised in Vietnam, but my grandparents were born and raised in China. I'm not exactly sure which part. 100% Cantonese. Nelson, where are your parents from? My parents are from uh, Zhongshan. They moved to Macau when they were like teenagers. I was actually born in Macau, so I'm full Cantonese for that. Our grandfather's from Hongshan, but dad got born in Guangzhou, but then got raised in HK. In this video, we are gonna be eating two levels of Cantonese food. And I don't wanna say that this is like the hood style, but this is definitely more the like, the down home style. The homie style, cash only type style. And then we're going to take it to a new fancy Cantonese restaurant that just opened up in the 626. So we're gonna see both levels. And I think that this is interesting because Cantonese do have all levels. The same place that you get $2 dim sum, you can buy like a $60 crab there. You can buy one piece of abalone that's $250. Yeah. Right. yeah definitely. So crazy. even within a single Cantonese restaurant, there's different levels. And I think it's confusing for a lot of people, but that's why we have to start here at Sambu, one of the most famous barbecue spots in LA. That when you grow up Cantonese in America, going to these like real hole in the wall, quote unquote, low end hood spots, everybody does it. It's normal. It's part of the culture, basically. This know? is your to go spot. So if you are doing like a party and you need four ducks, this is where you're gonna get it. But you're not necessarily taking girls here on dates. No. <laughs> I'm gonna taste everything right now. What's going on with the duck? Mm. Roast duck in Cantonese is seal op. Guess what a sound a duck makes? Op. You think it sounds like quack, okay? But let's be honest, man. It could sound like op too. Everybody try the chashu. Oh, the candy flavor. Oh my gosh. Mmm. Being like the first large amount of Asians in America, what are some things that we can be proud about being Cantonese for? Resilience. Sacrifice, one of the most hardest working Asians out there. Yes, yeah. by far. We created the seven day a week restaurant. Yeah. If you needed a restaurant open on Christmas day, that's and, and I'll tell you this, me and Andrew are half Northern. Northern people will not open seven days a week. And they're not trying to do 16 hour shifts either. I definitely think that Cantonese are really open minded. We'll yeah. eat anybody else's food. I think the most open minded foodie at their core are Cantonese. Because if you think about the positioning of Canton or Southern China, it is in between Southeast Asia and East Asia. It has all of mid and northern China and then Japan and Korea up there. But then below, it's right next to Vietnam. There's lots of Chinese people in Thailand and Cambodia. Yep. People from southern China are the ones that went everywhere in the world, started businesses, started the Chinatowns in Jamaica, in Panama. And I know personally people from there. And that's what's like incredible about it. And they're not playing around with how big this paint on there. That is, that's a nice slice. Looks almost like a mushroom. No, that's part of like an orange. You know how a lot of Canto restaurants are open really late? Uh, oh, like, like there's you, seafood you, restaurants that are open late to like 12 a.m. where you can buy lobsters and fish. Kids running around at 11.30. Yeah. I, I've been to those restaurants late at night. I think there's something about Cantonese culture that I noticed where they just stay up late. And, and I will say this. I do think I know enough about other Asian groups to say that some other Asians might have bedtimes, but Cantonese kids do not. Did you guys have a bedtime? Nope. Strict bedtime? Strict bedtime, no. Like there, there's times my parents told me to go to sleep, but they never be like, you need to be in bed by this time. No, I and then, no, no, Kanto's not a big fan of like the hardcore structure. Yeah, with, right. the, with the ground rules and stuff, you know, like that, like the house rules. I think there's an assumption that like, you're just not gonna be that crazy. Me and Andrew got so into entertainment is that we would stay up and watch Jay Leno, David Letterman, Conan O'Brien. And you know how like you watch all those variety shows, you get so much uh, exposure to the entertainment world as a young kid. I do feel like that Cantonese people are the only person who would have like 
Oh, another thing that's kind of off topic, only in hood canto spots, like a restaurant like this, I can see you sweating and we're not having like hot pot or something. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Why don't you take off the beanie and show them your you're being canceled? You know, we grew up in the Seattle area, which was very close to Vancouver. And Vancouver, Canada, is known to be kind of like a fancy Cantonese place. Think about it, Hong Kong was a British colony. With Australia and Canada, those are still like very closely tied with England. So if you have an English passport or you have some sort of relationship through being colonized in Hong Kong, then you would go to either Canada or Australia. Our dad's raised in Hong Kong. So, you know, we identify as HK Cantonese. But growing up, we didn't meet that many HK Cantonese in America. I feel like we got so hoodenized, I can't even relate to the <laughs> HK Cantos anymore. When I look at two cultures, I don't see socioeconomic class first. I look at the way people talk, the way people interact, their friendliness. Of course I acknowledge that Cambodia town and little Tokyo look completely different, like socioeconomically. But that's just not always the first thing on my mind. But I'm saying that that's so Cantonese of me to see it that way. I think other people might see it as skin color or money. I think it's because just in a canto world, there's so many different people, canto, like there might be a really poor canto or there's really rich canto people. There's just a whole wide spectrum. We can see that with our own people, our own friends and family. There's always yep, a rich yep, uncle yep, yep, somewhere yep. in a Cantonese family. And then like nobody else gotta be rich. I always say that being canto gives you super large amounts of perspective. Yeah, and, and Because I, you see the high and the low all in even like one street. You know what it leads you to have when you have a lot of perspective? It leads you to be really funny. If you think about it, Aquafina's part Cantonese, Ronnie Cheng's part Cantonese, Hella goofy, man. Jimmy O. Yang, Ali Wong, Jin, Jin, Stephen Chow, the bro. godfather of Chinese oh, comedy. Dude, there's this one scene from this old Stephen Chow movie where he's eating and smoking a cigarette at the same time. He's like so sad, right, yeah, about yeah, a breakup. Yeah, and, then he's, and then he's just right? eating, and then as he's chewing, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like to, to wash down the food with the cigarette, and he looks mad, like desperate and sad. Would you say that one of the things about being Kanto is you gotta be at least a little bit goofy? Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> my dad still calls my mom to us mommy. mommy. He'd be like, to mommy gone. Oh, yeah. and, and you're like, but that's my mom. But <laughs> that's his mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says that, it says that. No, but, but you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. just the role in the family. Yeah. Mommy, right? Dad would say daddy too. Yeah. Daddy. Let, listen to daddy, okay? <laughs> daddy tell you, David. Don't worry. Talking about Cantonese, Cantonese come up with some incredible slang. And you know the word boba? They actually don't use the word boba in Taiwan because boba in Taiwan means big boobs. The people who came up with that slang was in Hong Kong. No, I remember boba. this lady got offended one time I was when I was in Taiwan and I was like, oh yeah, can I get some boba? boba, boba, boba. And then I was asking for the big boba, so I was like, boya <laughs> and And then she was like, ah! I think what a lot of people feel about Cantonese food, and then this, you know, does reflect onto the culture as well, is like Cantonese food, it's tasty and it's cheap, but then it's not as trendy or cool right now. Like we were joking earlier, this is not the greatest date spot. Any Cantonese spot in America would not necessarily make a good date. In America, now I'm not saying across the world. To me, the reason that Cantonese are super underrated is um, because like a lot of the people who came over, they used to open up Cantonese restaurants, but they actually weren't chefs. They were just cooking to make money, and then it kind of brought a bad name, but once you get the, the people who actually know how to cook this stuff, it's incredibly complex. It's actually one of the most complex foods in Asia, bar none. Even to make this one ton skin right here, this process is so complicated. Yeah. Oh, think of how many different flavors and ingredients we have on this table right here. And this is not even the craziest spread. You have lobster noodles, you have a fried fish with soy sauce, you have roast duck here, duck feet, okay? You have fried fish skins, you have roast barbecue pork, you have one ton, you have kanji. I don't like to feel like we're like cheap food people forever. Like, I don't believe that. Like, we have expensive food and we're about to go eat it. So, before we go on to our next spot, what are our takeaways from eating here at Sam Wu? This is nostalgic, man. Pretty much, just like what I grew up on. Brings back good memories. This is considered the low end spot, but you know, this is what we kind of had to eat growing up, you know, with our parents or we had low income and whatnot. Them feeding us, this is probably still a lot of money to them. No, so that is look, true. Look, looking at this, hanging out as homies and stuff, like we look back, like, you know, this is very humbling and I'm very appreciative for being Cantonese and, you know, my childhood and my upbringing and my culture. See? 
This is the cheapest high-end dish I think that you can get in Asian America, period. For Cantonese, to be able to cook this level of complex food for this cheap is unbelievable. Still make it taste good. It's delicious, actually. Make it tasty. Make it tasty. Now that we did the quote-unquote hood spot, you guys ready to hit the fancy one? Yes. I'm with it, man. Yeah. All right, let's go. here at Opal in San Gabriel. Did you guys ever think that growing up in San Gabriel, Alhambra, that there would be a spot like this? No. Never, never. never. <laughs> I thought I walked into one of those nice, no. uh, brand new casino hotels, you know, in Macau. And just a lobster on fire. For you know how. Huh? This uh, barbecue pork. Uh, and this one is a uh, mustard pork. Shoot, shoot you, you uh, shoot you. It's like so snowfish. Yeah, yes. snowfish. <laughs> I speak Cantonese. The last one? It would be the Wagyu. Wagyu, Wagyu beef. Hot you all now. This has all been elevated by seafood. Chef Horace, uh, take out the haimi. I got this. Lobster noodles with ifu noodles. Like lobster lobster with, with ifu noodles. <laughs> <laughs> Oh look, they got serving chopsticks. Yo, yeah. let's go in. So let's start with the classic Cantonese dishes, the cha siu. Not super sweet. Mm. I love the candying on the outside. It's a little lean, more on the chewier side. Mm -hmm. Yo, we gotta get into this one. Let me serve this up. This Chilean sea bass. Hit me. Mm. It's buttery, wow. man. The sea bass, man, what we call the suit. You my dad used to like fishes a lot. You know what? It's good if it tanga. Basically, if it bounces off your teeth when you're eating, it just like boom, 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 boom slider. <laughs> that sea bass, bass got bounced. Got bounced. So they got this shoot you yeah. almost feeling like a scallop. Kai mu, huh? Mm. It's like your traditional walnut prawns, except it's got a wasabi kick to it. It's not too heavy when you're eating. Like you could eat like a lot of these. Whereas if you eat the mayonnaise version, you can eat like two and then you're done. What they're doing here is sort of shucking some of the national stereotypes about Cantonese food out the window. Yeah. They are elevating it, but they're still keeping the core of the Cantonese cuisine intact. So often Canto food is cooked at a very cheap level. Mm -hmm. So of course the ingredients are not going to be top notch and all this and it's served very quickly. But if you take your time and even just improve the quality and or even spice flavor, it up, change it up a little bit, up, you know? it can be as good as any other dish. Food itself may be good, but if you don't make everything around it, the experience, how the food is presented, how, how the waiters even talk to you. Yeah. Because it's almost like the Apple iPhone, they don't just give it to you. They give it to you in a super nice box. Hey, this, this, one, ton this one ton, man. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> hey, who cheers one ton soup? <laughs> Yo, that soup is so wow. clean and tasty. Wow. You know he'd be boiling wow. that in five plus hours. That one ton soup, it tastes like Hong Kong. How can we bring other Cantonese people to be willing to spend more money to try the higher end Cantonese food? I feel like if they did try it, they would be willing to spend the money on it. So far, I have not been disappointed with one thing yet. Everything is just elevated. There is branding issues, man. <laughs> so that's why you gotta market yourself in America. And I just feel like it's been misrepresented, misunderstood. When we first came out with the 626 music video, and we were doing YouTube, and we were speaking Mandarin and Cantonese, there was Chinese people who would not believe that we were eating Chinese. They couldn't believe that their own people would make a, a fancy production, I guess. Yeah. This is exactly why we need to make videos. Videos like you guys are making are just breaking these type of barriers, because you have Cancel people you guys know who are shutting down these ideas and even when it's done they still have doubt. Do you guys think the doubt makes them feel comfortable? Because it's almost like it counts yourself out. Because yeah. you know how once you believe something's possible, it makes you uncomfortable because now you have to go do it. No, it, it it's, but it's almost like it makes yourself comfortable to take yourself out of the race. No, right? it's like when you when uh, you set yourself out of from talking to like a girl you really want to talk to. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about her. I'm, I'm gonna go. Oh, talk she ain't to never her. gonna like me. Uh, no, no, no. And you set yourself. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm too short. All oh, my hands. Like, they're playing not to lose. So if you put themselves out of the race out of competition. You can't lose because you're never in it to be Exactly. Human. You're losing, yeah. And dude, people was like, always like, you know, when we made, me and Andrew, uh, our music hasn't been as well received as our comedy. And people be like, oh, it's cringe, it's cringe. You know, to me, being cringy, it don't mean nothing to me. Because yep. it means that I'm taking shots. Yep. And sometimes I don't have the team around me or the systems or maybe we music rush production some, we or rush something out. And it ended up, may or may not have, I agree that it ended up a little cringy. I don't care. You're gonna lose every time if you don't shoot. 
Because I'm like, somebody gotta make videos. Listen, maybe our next video is better. Maybe our next music video is better. Maybe someone else's next music video is better because of what we did. But and I'm like, no, unless you actually do it. No, nobody's bad and no one's stepping up to bed. Listen. Some people are mad that we're the only ones batting. Seriously, some people are mad. Oh, oh it should have been somebody else. Some right? making videos. Why? Why are they making videos? So I'm like, why don't you do it then? Because we're the only ones making videos. That's why we're making videos. It's easy to be a world class critic, it's hard to even be a C level creator. Oh, that's a line. Yo, all right, let's try this peeking duck, guys. Pockets here folded nicely, almost Boy, like a pocket no. square. Yeah. Wow. That caviar is like. It's, man, I might just have to eat this caviar by itself, bro. I got a challenge for any people that are Cantonese, part Cantonese, or even know a Cantonese person. I would like you to challenge them to do something that pushes the culture forward. Wow. Even if that's just hosting a dinner for their friends. But I just think mentally is probably the most important thing to start with. Just be mentally more aggressive, you know, be more, obviously more open-minded, get out of your comfort zone and be in attack mode rather than be on defense mode. But what do you think uh, allowed you to be in attack mode? I mean, it might be the people I kind of hung out with and grew up with, you know, they're not conservative, they're more outgoing and doing a bunch of like, crazy things where, you know, normally a, a traditional Cantonese person would not do. I gotta give big shout out to Gage your mom now. For a first generation Chinese person, you know, especially when you speak Canto, she's very supportive of whatever you wanna do. That is true. I think a lot of times when you say what you wanna do, it's a lot of parents don't think you're gonna be successful. Exactly. Right. In their mind, they already know. Because they're fearful. Actually, yeah, it comes exactly. from a fear it's, from it's them. Yeah. Like if you told them and they knew that you were gonna be good, then they wouldn't say that. The first thing they jump to is just like, oh my God, he's gonna fail. They were coached from an era of Asia where you didn't get a lot of chances at life. If you look at America and the structure of the West, it allows for a lot of chances. It's almost like you get like six swings at your at bat, and in Asia, they've all been coached that you just get one swing. Yeah. You either make a hit or you out. Now, remember when we filmed that Kobe signature moves in New York Chinatown? Yep. The day before, I told uh, a friend of ours that I, we were gonna film that. It's cancer friend. Mm -hmm. Cancer friend, and it was cold. And he goes, dude, don't do it, you're gonna die. You can't do that, you can't do that. And I remember I looked at him straight in his face and I did not have a smile on my face. And I just said, man, all I hear is you just telling me what I can't do. Yeah. You're not telling me what I can do. You're not giving me a solution about how I can accomplish that. All you're doing is spending all your breath telling me what I can't do. And guess what? I stopped being friends with that person right there in that spot. You show people that even if they don't have a gym and it's in the winter in New York, you can start a YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah. I started it in one of the coldest winters in New York that season. I was freezing my butt off out on the park in the streets where it was like 10 degrees. Whatever you have around you, just, just use it and just go out and do it. If anything you guys take away from our videos that even if people around you telling you this is the cap of maximum what's possible, nah, you can have your cap up here, like way beyond that. Yeah, no cap, no cap, yeah, no cap, <laughs> no, no cap, for real. Quai fa kt, quai fa kt, go. I like that little seasoning stuff mm. on top. Yo, that they had a little herbs on top. That tastes different. Yeah, it does. That man. was very floral. Oh, that was good though. Yo, you see this little daisy? Yeah. Think I'm scared? <laughs> no. I can do. Do it. Look what you made me do. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is just Cantonese are underrated. And I think that we have to take some responsibility for why that is. Once you've acknowledged the situation and you know that there are certain factors beyond your control, but there are factors within your control, then it is up to you to go change those factors and take action. Can't Yo, that's crazy. You can do it. Yo, that's if you just keep doing what you've been doing, you're gonna keep getting what you've been getting. And I guess if you're okay with what you've been getting, then carry on. And if you're not okay with what you've been getting, you gotta, you, do something, but take you gotta do something. And if you don't attack, I will say this. If you really cannot attack and, and be proactive and make something happen, at least support. Support somebody who is doing something that you enjoy, that you feel is pushing it forward, keeping the culture alive. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching that video. Shout out to Kev, shout out to Nell. This is David and Andrew from the Fung Bros. Please, in the comments down below, let us know what you think about the future of Cantonese culture and food around the world.
and give us any updates from where you're at if something cool is going on. By the way, I know that everything we said is just like our experience. It's our it's experience. It's just our, it's our experience. opinions. Hey. I don't know. You know, it might have been completely different where you guys were at. I'm sure we're gonna get maybe some uh, corrections as far as historical facts. I'm willing to read those as well. All right, everybody. We are in San Gabriel, California, and until next time, we out. Peace. Quite far, Katie, go. Quite far, Katie, go. Quite far, Katie, go. I can't tell you, it can be funny sometimes. <laughs>